so um, our second speaker for the evening is Haji Saba Khalid. Um, sorry, Haji Saba Khalid. She's a, a prolific speaker and author. Prolific. <laughs> 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 um, she's very, she's been very active during the feminist movement in the 60s and has ever since been active in bridge building between people of all faiths and challenging people from all walks of life. She's lived in various communities um, and her experiences and knowledge from Western background of both Islam and Western culture give her deep insight and help with ideas in solving some of the complex and social problems we face in the UK. I I'm going to stop speaking now and let um, ask you first about that. And then we'll, after the uh, talk, we're going to have a discussion and then if you want to ask any other questions, then you can. Is it possible to kind of converge a bit? Can we just get closer? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You just just come in because um, it's more feminine anyway. <laughs> just come in close. Come in close. Get together. Connect. by um, the civil rights um, activity in America. 
But I realized then at a certain point, I seemed to hit a sort of, no, something stopped. As there was a block. Something wasn't right. And I couldn't find myself moving forward. And, and I found I'd lost direction. I didn't know what I was doing, what I was there for, what the meaning of it all was. And I felt um, in a state of real des desperation because our commitment in the 60s was complete. You know, it was, it was extremist in that sense. We were either that or we were nothing. And I reached the nothing point. And I went down to southern Spain. And there, I, for one, some reason, I stood on a hillside in southern Spain. And I basically called out into the cosmos, into the universe. And I was a secular, secular, secular woman. I mean, I was raised as a secular middle class woman. And I called out, where do I go from here? What if, if there's anyone there, anything there, please send me an answer. And the answer was immediate. I got the instantaneously a response, which was, I knew it wasn't from myself. It was, it was inside me, but it was not of me. And the, and the response was, when you know yourself, you will fear no one. Very simple. That was it. And I got that response, and I knew it wasn't, it was not me. It wasn't my words. It wasn't me. And I began to, began to be tuned in. And um, over the course of the next couple of months, I kept on getting indications of the same type. And finally, I thought, I said, uh, well, I questioned, where is the beginning of the path? What, where do I go from here? What is the way forward? I mean, I didn't know it was Buddhist, Catholic, you know, what it was all about, where I was supposed to go. And what I did, learned from a previous little moment was that the end, it was the end of decision. This was the end of me deciding anything. It was the end of me looking and searching and thinking and worrying and wondering and reading. It was just to be switched on for the next instruction. And it was very close. It was wherever I turned, wherever I was, that was surrounded me. The whole cosmic intelligence was there, absolutely around me, and inside me, of course. So um, I said, where, where do I go from here? Where's the next stage? I've got to go towards this movement onwards from here. What, what happens now? And then I got the last indication, the last statement, which was non-verbal, non-audible, non -audible, just a, a, a completely clear response. It said, go back to the place, to the place of your fear. Go back to what you ran away from. That was it. Go back to it. And I knew exactly where that was. I knew its address. I knew how to get there. So I got in my car in southern Spain and drove all the way up to London. And in London, in this address, this <coughs> I found this mentor's house, actually, Jane Arden, she was called. I went to her house and up the stairs and said, here I am. I ran away from her, actually. I had enough. And in that, in that room was a friend, of, an old friend of hers, a Scottish man, who I knew was a, a Muslim and a Sufi. I wasn't, inter I mean, I wasn't concerned about him being Muslim and Sufi, but I did know that those people knew how to address the Almighty. They had what's called uh, etiquette. They knew how to talk to, the, to God, you know. And I knew that I didn't. I was all over the place. I didn't know how to talk to God at all. I was very... You know, I mean, I was just being myself, and it wasn't. I, I felt that I needed to know more. I needed to know how to talk to, to, to the divine, to the Almighty. And, and he said, just said, you go to the bathroom, and you wash your arms, you wash your head, you wash your mouth, your eyes. I mean, your nose. And then you go into to this cup here, and you 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 pray. You put your head on the ground five times a day, pointing in that direction. He didn't say pray, just put your head on the ground. And I thought, at these times of day, in the morning when the sun is there, in the, in the midday when the sun is there, and then in the afternoon when it's over there, and in the evening when it's just on the horizon, and then at night when it disappeared. 
specifics. And I think, that's amazing. That's, that's cosmic. You're tuning into the cosmic all the time, regularly, wherever you are, whoever you're with. Anyway, the, the word Islam wasn't mentioned at, at any point in that conversation. But ultimately, within a month, I was fasting Ramadan and I had made my shahada. But the, what, what I'm trying to say is that actually, Islam is a gift for life. Life is not for Islam. Islam is for life. It's to steer. It's, to, it's a steerage system. It, it, it keeps you um, moving in the right direction and in, in focus. And my experience as a, as a feminist, which I still am, actually, by the way, um, was profoundly political. Because I, I, um, I realized there's something wrong with me, but I discovered by my investigation searches that actually it was everybody else, too. It wasn't just me. Something was wrong <coughs> in the society. Something was wrong in the, in the world as it is today. And I met many, many people. And, and this was, it was how, how to get beyond it, how to, how to recover from it. That's what I was looking for, not just for my own personal salvation. And I found that this, this uh, hidden secret, it was open secret, provided a, an answer for one's personal life, how to be humanly in a less, in a less dangerous and risky situation, how to be on course and how you lived as a group, as a society, how you interacted as a society. And they provided both those sides, which is what I call the creature and the habitat. Every creature needs a habitat. And there's a habitat that's good for the creature, there's a synergy with the creature and keeps it and protects it. <coughs> and that's what I found was what I had discovered in, in, this, in this, what we call deen, or way of life. It's not a religion at all. Actually, but the Muslims themselves are beginning, beginning to turn it into a religion, unfortunately. But that's a whole other subject. But now it is actually how to live your life, how to run a country or society, how to be together as a group, as human beings, and do not injure one's, oneself personally and not injure each other collectively. So that was my my journey into Islam by feminism, by searching for myself, and by looking on to solutions to other problems we have in the world today. I wanted to read to you a little excerpt from Germaine Greer. Do you, do you, I expect most of you have heard of Germaine Greer, have you? You know Germaine? Germaine Greer? Do you know Germaine Greer? Yeah. Wow! <laughs> she is the, like, um, no, no, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm old. <laughs> no, but she's very contemporary, and she, she's like, uh, Nelson Mandela and the feminist movement. She's, she's iconic and she's written some incredible books. Anyway, she says here, what well, among many quotes I have, is that? <laughs> if equality means entitlement to an equal share of the profits of economic tyranny, it is irreconcilable with liberation. Freedom in an unfree world is merely license to exploit. She, she's saying, we don't want to be like that. We don't, we don't want to be successful people who rule the world and take all their natural resources and dominate them, take, take war to them. And <clears throat> that's not who we are, that's not what we want. We don't, that's not the equality we're looking for. In fact, she's very much a vive la, vive la différence type of, of thing, as most of the great feminists are. I mean, there's others like um, Camilla Paglia, um, and uh, <coughs> she could say, um, um, Jack Nicholson <laughs> says, I mean, this is quite, quite funny, he says, today you've got, is, this, is, is it me talking? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, that's a bit better, yes. <laughs> there is no longer, he's, um, she's, he says, today you've got endless women who don't know if they want to be a mother, have lunch, or be secretary of state. The other day I heard a quote from a leading feminist who said, finally, we women have become those husbands we wanted to get rid of. 
and, 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 and a well-known journalist called Maureen Dowd, who writes for the New York Times, says, now we have bimbo feminism, giving intellectual pretensions to a world where the highest ideal is to acknowledge your inner slut. Slut waters, please take note. But it's, it's um, they're an interesting bunch, actually. They're very varied in their, in their, uh, in their analysis, but all pointing the sense in the same direction is we're not there to be a subspecies of male. There is a difference between man and woman. And in fact, in another, um, they all say that, actually. They all say the same thing in the end. Um, and D.H. Lawrence, David Herbert Lawrence, says, boys and girls should be kept apart that they may have some sort of respect and fear for the gulf that lies between them in nature and for the great strangeness which each has to offer the other finally. We are all wrong when we say there is no vital difference between the sexes. There is every difference. Men learn their feelings from women. I think that's, women are non-linear. They can, they can, they have met. <coughs> Pre-technological human Okay, I can drink that for there. Um, yeah, he's, he's um, he says that the, 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 the no, their feelings for him because women, women um, have a non-linear, and in fact, in the brain itself, you, I don't know if some of you already studied the brain, the doctors or cerebral studying the brain, but there are, it's a different structure, male and female, um, in, inside the brain. The two hemispheres are well connected, but in, in women, language, language um, uh, pathways. And in males, on the whole, they're not, they're not well, they're not, mostly it's on the right sided, but it doesn't cross over into the, the sort of intuitive world, so that they are you know, physiologically, biologically, obviously different. Um, and there are, there are variations, of course. He said, we should keep girls and boys apart on mixing with one another in being pals. They lose their own male and female integrity, and they lose the treasure of the future, the vital sexual polarity, the dynamic magic of life. And this question of, di of polarity is so key, it's lost sight of now, because now we have a homogenistic uh, society. Everybody goes and works for the same multinational corporations. They all have their bank, their money inside the same banks, you know, and, and they all they become like that milk that's somewhat homogenized. So it, there's no difference is being eradicated all the time, and this is um, this is what we I, actually I wanted to have a discussion about this subject. You know, I, I, I'd like to hear what other women and men uh, think about. This particular, this particular matter of the difference and whether it's a good thing and how we can preserve it. I also wanted to say, and because I, this is to put a bit of a bomb in the marketplace, a bomb in the thing, that we are having now an incredibly serious situation with the abuse of women in Islam, in the Western world. I don't know if you know about this, but it is to the point where there is now a, um, a foundation devoted to rescuing abused and abandoned Muslim women and their children off the streets in the big cities. And, and uh, this is something which we have to, as women, as Muslim women, take care of. They are not being served by the mosques. In fact, I have to say that the, the leader of this foundation, the founder of it, was an amazing woman, she said she won't pray in the mosque anymore. This, I'm saying this just because it is true. That's what she said. They will not pray in the mosque because what she has seen and heard from these women who she's rescued, picked up off the streets and found housing for and is providing with proper accommodation. Now this is a problem that we have to look at. We have to look at it because we cannot allow this to continue. And if the mosque has just become a gentleman's club to have, um, you know, reminiscing about Pakistan, with, the whole earth is a mosque. The whole earth is a mosque, that the Prophet said so long ago. And that is what is true. We don't need this building. The mosque is a place where people behave like Muslims. Whatever piece of ground there are, wherever they live, that is a Muslim, that is a mosque. You know, that is purity. And, and as far as the 
other issue I'd like to discuss with you, but there's no time really because I'd rather have a discussion now, is the whole question of the financial system which oppresses all of us, destroys all of us, and, and deceives all of us. And it is totally, in his Islamic language, it is haram. But the Muslims are in denial, they're not looking at it, and at the same time this thing is not just destroying us, it's Muslims, it's destroying the human race, and it is destroying the fish in the seas, whether they are the fish are, stocks are sinking fast, it's, it's melting icebergs, and is um, polluting the atmosphere, and is um, actually creating poverty <coughs> constantly. And now is our time, it's now we're getting that poverty consequence. What it has created is put everybody into debt. It's done a coup d'etat, a coup de debt. It, it controls the world by debt. And debt in Islam, when it's accompanied by interest, is called usury as we know it. It's an old-fashioned obsolete word in the English language now. But that's the, the system we live under, the financial system is a usurious system by which everybody is controlled because they're in debt. Debt creates anxiety. You can, you're never in the present tense. You're always concerned about the future. You never can be at rest. There's a lot of problems of depression now, anxiety, and, and which are now being medicated. Th these are all issues we have to talk about as women in general, and as Muslim women in particular. So I, I would like, if possible, and men too. I see one nodding there. Yes, you speak. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna encourage you to, we've got to address this matter. This is not just having a chat. This is about saying, what are we gonna do? <coughs> these, these young women are, in desperate straits, and so a lot of them are converts, red reverts, or whatever you want to be called. They're new Muslims, a lot of them, who've been grabbed and made, brought into, into second life situations, or even third, given children and then dumped. There's lots of them around now, in all the cities of this country, probably in Europe. And they, we can't go, go on pretending it's not happening. It is happening, and we have to do something about it. So I would like to encourage you all to this react, if you're not too much in shock of what I just said, please, please volunteer. The point is for us to unify in our discussion and unify in our ideas for how we can change this situation, okay? <coughs> because there you have a success story, personal success. Let's have a collective success, a collective success. This is what we need now, okay? Come on, out with it, feminists included. Come on, all of you. Yes? Um, when you talk about um, Muslim women um, mm. <coughs> on the street of being rescued and the work that's going on there, do you think um, that the issue may or possibly could be that um, within the Muslim community or different Muslim communities there, there's a fear of recognising as a problem because it doesn't want to be seen as a community that's struggling or Well, they shouldn't be afraid. They're Muslims. It's time yeah. for to stand up and say, "Got any problems with us? Come and tell us." You answer that question. You answer that question. Um, <laughs> um, no, there is a lot of brushing under the carpet. Um, my dad was um, chair of the local Islamic society for a bit, and uh, kept talking about how he wanted to talk about. Um, he wanted the the Friday prayer sermons to be about actual issues, issues real issues. like um, what drugs, for example, is a massive yeah. issue yeah. in Muslim communities that mm. nobody wants to talk about. Exactly. And um, and it's um, but you can't even broach that issue with other people in in the committee because they'll just say, "Oh, we can't do this. We can't talk about these things," because they there's a certain kind of status thing between different families and they don't want to bring up anything that's an issue that might affect them because it lowers their status relative to other people and blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, so we, we continually not talk about the important problems that we need to talk about. Okay, well I'm opening the can here. Okay? I'm opening the can. Because this is not Islamic behaviour. This is not what Sayyidina Umar al Khattab would do. He'd go right in there and rip the thing apart. You know, this is the real companion of the Prophet. 
Yes. Uh, what I was actually going to say is that what, what, uh, where I'm from, in, I'm from South London, yeah. where I'm from, like, these are the kind of issues that we address in our hospital. Like, we talk about all of these things. Do. There are people, there are things that are affecting Muslims and people within the community. Mm. And what's happening, I think, is it's more of a cultural thing that you see going on here. I, I don't actually know, I'm, I wasn't aware of what you were talking about previously. Yeah, we're not to South London, but from, like, it, it, it's just that confusion between um, between culture and faith, and I think that's something that people, I think especially there's a lot of non-Muslims who are here, and um, it's just I think something that you have to acknowledge that there is this within within any religion um, or any way of life, there's cultural aspects that seem to, to start to dominate and and, mm -hmm. and enforce so-called rules and regulations, which are not necessarily part of the faith, and it's just not confusing those two things, um, faith and faith and the religion of Islam being how it is, and this cultural way of life, yeah. where things like status within family and status But that's within, a common human thing, we've had that in England as well. Um, Fortunately, that is gone. But it used to be just the same, so the private, <coughs> private don't tell the neighbours. But even with husband. the status of women within, within the Islamic family, it's known, like, women are the backbone of Islam, that's what we're, that's what we're known to be. Um, there are so many strong women within Islam, it's so easy to brush those women aside and to look at the negative aspects of how cultural has... Yes, I know. Can I put, put bring you in? Because that is true, but they're not alive today. We have to be, we have to follow their... We have to remember them and do what they would do. They wouldn't put up with it. Aisha would never put up with this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Please speak. Um, so basically, so I recognise like, all of what you're saying. And I asked this most, like, because... I'm Would you speak just a wee bit, Lana? Oh, sorry. Possibly. I've only just, I've just recently started reading about Islam, so this is more out of just mm. me not knowing, rather than being, like, accused of or, like, yeah. contradicting anything. But what I would like to know is, from any kind of Muslim feminist, is because the impression that I've got is, of course, there are, in the Quran, there are a lot of kind of scary passages which do talk about a lot of abuse to women being acceptable, and there are sexist aspects of it. And I was wondering what I the impression I got is is that there is a there is in Islam a, a kind of like scripture is obviously very important and it's it's seen as kind of obviously as everyone but it's, if it's seen as absolute and kind of non-negotiable how you can how to reconcile because I don't know the different ways that people do like how I think you should read the Quran because you obviously haven't yeah no I haven't that's well, why I'm wondering read wondering. it and then we'll talk later because it's all nonsense that idea it's not true. There's, there's not true that that that, uh, that 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 women are rubbished in the Quran or they're oppressed or anything. No, not in general, but like in some. Yeah, but there's some. So some yeah. some ayats which are very severe towards men. Yeah. In the Surah Al Nur, you know, you're not allowed to speak against a woman. You know, very severe. You will be punished in this one and in the next if you speak against and make allegations about a woman when when you know you're not. It's not permitted. There's many many different. You need to get an only a. You need to read it yourself because people will always read something and focus on what is of personal interest to them and their personal obsession. Yeah. Or, or in, but you have to read it and see if you find that that to be true. <coughs> it actually, it's not true. There, there, are, there are messages for everybody. And the ones towards women are there's mostly positive, and there's I think there's one just saying you know if stay, keep keep it <laughs> take it easy and you know, keep it light. But that's all. I, I, at no point, I'm not here to justify the Quran. You have to read it and see what happens. In English, very good English translations. Just read it in English and see what you think. You know, it's quite. It's not that long to read in English, actually. and it's quite easy to read really as well. Um, any any other men got something to say about what goes on in the mosques? Shabazz. <laughs> uh, no, I <laughs> so, think, um, <coughs> Think your example of um, talk a bit louder. Can everybody hear me? I think your example of the different families having statuses within the mosque is is a generational thing. And I'm hoping now with the younger generation, with the younger men and the younger women who are starting to be more involved in the mosques, that those sorts of uh, traits are starting to change because they're not they're not stuck in that same sort of class war. So, 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 so I'm, I'm hoping that will change. Um, in, in, in 
you'll see that in the 20 odd years that I've been involved in various mosques, it hasn't really changed unless young people have come in. So here's a, there's a new generation, there's a new way of thinking. Yourself, for example, you, your experiences will give you a completely different way of looking at what the mosque should be, how it should function, and how it should interact with the non-Muslim community around it. Um, you see, this I, think, I think the key is, the key is the young people, for those of us who have children, I've got three children, for them to grow up, and I was really inspired by the way that you spoke about your father, um, because that's exactly what I'm going through at the moment with my daughters and my son as well, is allowing them that space to discover who they are as Muslims, uh, to question, to come to their own idea of what Islam is, so they can go practice it in the way that they want to, within a certain boundary, you know, within a boundary which is acceptable. Um, and doing it that way has made them very strong. They're stronger for it, rather than being very prescriptive. And I think that way of doing it then affects the, the mosques. I think that attitude, that outlook from life, will affect those sort of institutions. That's good. I, th I think also this is this is kind of in inside politics. Um, I, I'd like to know what women who are not Muslims but have seen and thought had some ideas about them. What, what, what do they, what do you think? What are your feelings having heard two, two women talk from very different places? And you're here in this room, so I imagine that means you have a sort of interest of some sort. Is that right? Are you interested? Oh, I'm not religious either. Yeah. At all. No. I pray, but I'm not religious. Okay. Um, you mentioned Islam book earlier, um, just as a sort of an aside. And yeah. I thought it was quite interesting because um, so last year I spoke at Islam book actually, and, and during the march um, I was walking alongside um, many Muslim women in, in um, headscarves and many women in nothing but a bra and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I think. Um, what I think what the, the danger is because you know there are many Muslim feminists out there and there are many feminists who are like who aren't religious at all and I think the danger is that um, we kind of we have this like this this separation um, you know where people say oh we don't want to like we don't want to, to have solidarity with these women who have these issues they they, they just want to release their inner slut kind of thing we shouldn't be working with them because we don't agree with them and then and, and then you know I think a lot of I mean a lot of white feminists can sometimes be a bit like just be like oh well you know Muslim Islam oh that's so sexist we want nothing to do with it and I think there needs to be like a really strong sort of coherent argument to, to bring the two together more because it it really does bother me um, that there is such this distance when you know at, at the end of the day I think um, Feminists and women can help each other so much. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, there's a uh, little. So. What, what, what I would like to see is a much sort of higher level of, of discussion going on. You know, that what is the destiny of a woman? I, I believe that's what brought me to actually the end to Islam. I believe I suddenly found myself calling on this destiny as a woman because I felt answers had to come from somewhere very deep and profound and extended. And that was what it was. It was this feeling of destiny that is a woman has a destiny that's collective, as well as the separate, special. The some are from different parts of the world, different diets. But that, in that way, they have a difference. But there's within all that, they are also have a destiny in the world. They have something to do, something to say, something to offer. And I think that's a very important subject to be looking at as women now, because a lot of women are at risk. You're a success story. <coughs> But humbly enough, not, not many women have that focus and determination, not many people. The, the, the normal Muslim woman, and women in general, I think they need to feel there's something that they are going, going towards as a, almost as a species. Do we have a, in terms of as a species, do we have a innate characteristics that unify us across all the differences in region and uh, race and all these things? Is there, is there, does that exist or is that a fantasy? I know that these people I've got here all believe that does exist. That all actually there's a 
there's an American well-known feminist, she's a, she's a professor at Harvard University, and she's done a lot of work on the feminist thing. She, she definitely believed there is an innate way that the woman, the voice of the woman is not heard in modern society. It's not, she says it's not heard, this voice is not heard. Because the system, she calls it the iron grip of the system, doesn't allow it. It, it only has a dominant masculine characteristic to, to, to prevail. The male voice in its different forms prevailed. We're talking psychology here as well, as well as sociology. And, and that's what she works with. If you have a balanced exchange of voices, the female voice being eclipsed, if you bring that voice up, and there, there's research is showing that that is a very specific way of communicating, it's different from men, you will have a completely different kind of society. <coughs> completely different. And this is a professor at Harvard speaking. It's not just me having an opinion. So these, these I'd say, at least think, do we have a destiny as a gender, across the whole world, do we even across the animal world? You know, you know, there's a wonderful thing that happened when a few years ago, when I was in Spain at the time, there was a, a case in, in East Africa, in in in, the, in where a lioness found a, an oryx calf, you know, it's got separated from its mother. And she, the pride was just there, the lioness, and, and the lioness guarded the oryx calf. This, this is this happened in, in Kenya just a few years ago, and was observed. And she, she made, she watched over the oryx calf for quite a long period of time. The mother would come and give it milk. The lioness would let it happen, and then protect it from the rest of the pride. That's female solidarity across species. A lioness protecting her prey's offspring within a hundred, couple of hundred years. That's nature saying something. That's nature saying there is a maternal, uh, where there's a, not sympathy, but um, when you em empathy, there's maternal empathy that will bring the, 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 the prey and the, the predator into one connection. That, that, that is a very extraordinary event, you know, and it proves something. And, we as, and I say this to you, I don't expect any answers today, but I'm just asking you. <coughs> we live in a very troubled world, and if you don't think it's troubled, I don't know what planet you're on, because the planet I'm on, there's a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties, a lot of actually scary stuff coming up the horizon. And as a woman, we have a power that we can use, but we have to know what it is. We have to be in touch with it. And I'm calling on you to get in touch with it, to find it, not as an individual, but as a species, as a, let's look after each other's children. Let's look after each other's children like those two animals did. That animal looked after this baby, which a tasty little piece of meat, she looked after it, because the maternal thing was above her appetite. That was, that's great, isn't it? Isn't that great? Nobody says anything. <laughs> it happens every day, right? They happen every day. Is that extraordinary? Come on, respond. <laughs> That's the women's thing. You respond. Yes. What do you think? Well, I think that we have to be very careful about essentializing identities. That, that, that's jargon. I didn't. No, that's complete jargon. So, to say that in a in a normal language. <laughs> um, I, I feel like we have to be be really careful about the way we look at gender, about the way we look at women as an identity, or we look at men as an identity. And I think that it's um, it's potentially problematic to to define women as, as such a homogenous. It's not a, it's not a cerebral problem. This is from the heart. This is great writers who I respect and feminists and. and Educated. We can we can reduce this to some dry little discussion, but this is not the arena for that. And this, this is you just have to take it on trust, which I know intellectually you're not allowed to do in, in our in our in our academic system. You're not allowed to take anything on trust, but you can't crush a discussion on the basis of some dry academic. It's it's principle. not crushing discussion. It's not making it non political because I understand the fact that we need unified identities to push forward with political movements. 
understand that. No, can we? Where are you talking this language of, the, of politics, which is so of, of activism, of yeah. change, yeah, right? Change, in yeah. order to change the yeah, policies, so, yeah. in order to change society, we need to have unified identities. And I understand. No, that no, no, no. Identity is not talking about identity. We're talking about specific species. We're talking about look, identity is a it. But species right. as it's the human on an individual. It's an individualistic word. But We're species not talking as human race or species as gender, species as um, what kind of what kind of definition of species are we using here? Because I feel like in order to push through and make change, we sure we we need to recognize that you know we exist as women perhaps, but we are all coming from such different backgrounds. I think that the way that we negotiate feminism and the way we relate to feminism and change is different depending on maybe if you're a Muslim woman, maybe if no, you're not, an atheist woman, not. maybe if you're a man, I feel that you should still be able to relate to feminism in your own way. For example, the, the Quran, I know that you know it's it's written is not written in English. So that depending on the way it's translated, you might read and negotiate with the Quran in a different manner. Yeah. If you're a Chinese Muslim, you would negotiate being a Muslim in a different way than say if you were um, in, you know, a white woman or you know a woman from the Middle East. You know, it's just it's all. Yeah, it's all. It's all. It's all. It's all that we know this language. It's the language of endless choice. You can choose and fix and mix and do anything you want, but in the end, you end up stuck where you are, and nothing changes. Them. Oceans continue to be polluted. The animals become extinct, and can somebody else talk? To you? <coughs> can we get back to the heart and out of this dreaded cerebral experience territory? Yes. I don't like it, but I'm going to back her up <laughs> because um, as long as you do it in the way I can, I can relate to. That's fine. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not an athlete. But I think looking at partly because I've been reading loads of magic for days, getting really, really excited. About it. Yes. And, um, <laughs> And I think looking at looking at feminist movements and looking at environmental movements that I play a big part of and um, global justice movements and economic movements in the world that um, that dominates that agenda is mainly white faces and that is a huge issue if we're trying to change for all of us and for all our worlds we need to accept that people are coming to feminism or coming to environment from a load of different ways. And if we, as, as sort of dominating white people in society, are setting that agenda and not allowing people to come in from those different ways and allowing other people to lead, then we're, we're failing as a movement and we're not going to make the changes that we need. Yeah, that would be a shame. I agree. And I hope it doesn't happen like that. That's all I can do. I hope they like other people. Um, so, has anybody got anything? Um, I can see we have we have a difficulty here because women are not talking. <laughs> yeah, except so there's, a, there's a hand. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. It's a it's a very basic question. Mm -hmm. All right, and it's really simple. Yeah. Uh, if someone says to you that in, in in Islam, it's quite oppressive towards women more than any other religion, what what what, what would you say to that? I'd say I'd say Muslims, certain Muslims are absolutely, and they use the the, the problem is they use a distorted interpretation which suits themselves, which you can do with anything, because we're human beings, we have yeah, choice. But, yeah, but, yeah, but do you not think that if you're saying it's hypothetical, then you're saying the Quran's hypothetical? The Quran isn't hypothetical, no. What, why would, sorry, I've lost you now. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I lost you. Are you saying that people interpret it wrongly? Is, is that what you're saying? The way, the way, you know, people, the Quran is there, and it's, we know about the Quran. It's, it's a, it's a, it's I, I'm, I, I thought what you were saying is that maybe people oppress women, but that's not taught. If that, if, I don't know what, what you're saying. Well, I don't know what you're, I don't quite know what you're saying. The, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the question is, uh, do, you, do you think Islam oppresses women? That, that's the question. No, Islam doesn't. Islam, look at Khadija, look, look at Aisha, look at all those amazing women before and since. But Islam, but Muslims are human beings. And in the Quran, Allah says, do not call yourselves Muminun. They said, don't call yourselves Muminun. The Mumin, Mumin is a different level of understanding, behavior. Yeah. Call yourselves Muslims. Because that means just simply doing the five pillars, being a good boy, and not doing well. But you, you don't go deeper than that. And that, that's, that's well, perfectly acceptable. But there's a huge territory beyond that, which, which makes you much closer to Allah, much 
And those people are the people of Ikhlas, the people of Ikhsan. Actually, Jibril came to the Prophet and said, talking about the three, this, um, Islam, Ikhsan, and what? Iman, Ikhsan, and what was the third one? Islam. 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 I said Islam. <laughs> there's three, though. There's a third one, which is even a higher level. Yes. Ihsan, Ihsan is total sincerity. Islam, Iman, Ihsan. Yes. And, and uh, the Iman is simply to believe. That's a good level, but it's not the whole story, it's just the beginning. And Iman is to believe, is, is not, that says you carry through, you carry on. Iman is the belief that goes with that. You believe that in the existence of God, you believe that things are going to have him be directed by the Creator. That Ihsan is when you have become very scrupulous and you plunge much deeper into the meanings of, of, of what is sent down, the meanings of, of things. You become, you become more profound, you go more profoundly into it. And that, that is the difference. And here we have people get stuck in the, in the Islam level and they, they stick it on like a, a put the clothes on, you know, they do this and they go through the motions of the prayers, but often that's where they, they end. And they, they don't use this to study the meanings of, 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 of the, what they're taught. That, that's, that's a difference between, it's like, it's like you. You can't be a, a fantastic athlete unless you work. You've got, to, you've got to get that exercises in, you've got to look for your diet, you've got to be focused. That's exactly the same. Then you end up as an Ihsan athlete, you know, and you, you get the prizes. But if you don't, if you just middle around, say, oh, I'm going to round this play and I do a bit of thing on the weekend and that's it, and I have a round of that, then you're a, what we call a, a, a Muslim, you're a rounders player who messes, who just plays enough, basic, you know, but their levels. And Ihsan is, is what is we aim at, Ihsan, you know. But I, I would say to, to the Muslim women here, I challenge you, we have work to do. We have serious work to do. And I say maybe you, my dear brothers, do you believe that we've got work, we've got work to do? Somebody's cut me off. <laughs> Has happened before. Do you, well, what, what do you think? Tell me. Have, are you shocked and horrified and say I'm behaving outrageously and saying the unacceptable things? Or not? Do you think that's true, what I think? Is there anything in it? Do we have a problem? Have we got work to do? No? Not. What? Not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie. It's okay. You know what? No, I don't know what you're asking. I was asking you, do we, do we have a problem? I'm, I'm not a woman. I'm, yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. It's a human being. I'm talking to you. No, I, I, I don't have what to do on the woman. I don't have work to do, no. Like, are you asking that us women have work to do? No, but you, it, 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 it is half the deen. Marriage is half the deen. You've got work to do because it's half what Islam is. Oh, all right, sorry, I'm going to say your question. I thought you said, do us women have work to do? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just saying there is work. It's half the deen. Half Islam is about the relationship between man and woman. And it makes up half of what, it is, what Islam is. And it's, you know, something that I feel is, is having seen and heard some of the things I've heard this, this last month, I'm horrified. And I think you've got to really do something. What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Come on, speak to the crowd. Uh, so, um, I was just going to uh, actually agree with the two women there that I think, um, to, to me, um, I, you know, I describe myself as a Muslim and a feminist. Is, is that there's, I mean, I, I can't speak about if there's any kind of particularly unifying thing for all women. I can pretty much say that the same is not true between men. I don't think there's any kind of unifying thing. Okay, you could, you could be lazy and say, oh, it's patriarchy, but patriarchy is a subset of men who, you know, who, who kind of operate that system. Yeah. But, um, but to me, there's a kind of, there's, there's a unity between all people which transcends that, that gender divide. 
um, that we all need to look after each other. And I think that's what that's what pushes me towards feminism, actually. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see what what you're what you're saying, but in a way, I say, and I agree with it. I think that's the end, that's the end result. But what D. H. Lawrence is saying that in fact it's about this thing about dynamic polarity. You can you can only be authentic with somebody else when you're authentic with yourself, and that goes on the level of of why it's male and female, and not just one unigender person. There is a way of knowing who you are. So you, you can have this dynamism. That's all that, that, that is like like electricity flashing through the air you know, that, that, that makes and the human race continue. I think to, from, from my personal perspective, that has only been possible in being conscious and comfortable in my masculinity. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. As if I wasn't, I think it would be very difficult yeah. for me to, to operate in the feminist context with, with women, I think. Yes, you have to be. You have. You have to be. But you can never be a woman. You're a man, and that, that's what you have to know about things from inside out, because that's what you are. And I can't you know what it is to be a man because I can only be a woman. That's all we need to know. And then after that, we can be friends. We can be pals. But I'm just saying that knowledge is there. I don't want to lecture on, on, on race and equality and all these things, please. I want to, I, I, I think I'm All I want to say is that I think it's, it's really important to recognize that not all women are feminists, definitely, and not all men are working for the patriarchy. Of and course that this, they're not. This type of, of course they're course, not. Exactly, of course they're not. Yeah. So then this, this essential polarity that um, you seem to be pushing for, for this um, identity as women to fight for feminism, no, I'm not saying is, fight for feminism. That's a political statement. This is not political. This is biological. I'm talking biology. This is this is where I, you I'm either biologist. are something which is defined like a, a kangaroo doesn't have this problem. Because I'm a kangaroo, and you're a bouncer. I'm a being my kangaroo, and I'm happy as pie. There's a way you can be. We as human beings can uh, can also do that by actually knowing who we really are. From but for my most immediate biology, on our up and down, totally. I think you, if you if you deny that it's irrelevant with what sex I am and what it is, it's absolutely not, nothing to do with it. It's all about what I think in my brain. Then I think you know I, I can I can never agree with you till the end of time. I would disagree with you because I mean I think that that premise which denies one the conditioning of biology is is completely you can't even talk to that. You can't even have a I, I discussion come from a biological background. That is my training. Well, it's training, it's not yourself, it's just something you've got in your head. It's not to do with who you are. What, who you right. are is something and completely different. And I might, not, I might not identify with my biology. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there are lots of people who don't identify with their biology and they have a lot of problems. With it. I mean, that's true. That's right. I don't have any problems. Well, but <laughs> my, my point, my, my, my point is, is not about biology. I'm not talking about the type of difference. I'm talking about the mentality that we are, we should be forming coalitions and we should be but forming that's connections. A, that's the talk of politics. This is what we're trying to get away from. It's all about mental thoughts. It's about structures and control. I'm talking about finding that thing which the lion has found with but the But the diet itself is very cerebral. What? It wasn't cerebral. That was a discovery from the elemental place in her being. That, that the two creatures, baby, come on, I'm going to help you. Yeah. You're in danger, I know they're not. She said, I know they're not because they're eating in half a minute, aren't you? Keep an eye on that baby sitting for me. coming to shut me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really sorry, I think we're going to have to end it there because we have run over time quite a lot. Does that have a lot of It showed that it showed that there were people that the vast majority of Muslim people they want change, they want equality, they want feminism. And that's just it's so it's so refreshing. To say that I really liked it. I think uh, it's very important to bring together these subjects um, nowadays. Um, to talk about religion is something that mainstream uh, media and society we don't really have.
have the opportunity to do it. Um, and the fact that we bring together feminism and religion and culture in such a variety and with so many, um, so much discussion. And I think it's, it was very important. It was very good. Thank you so much for for holding this in the university. Thank you so much.